I'm an American citizen, right? Uh, you know, I was born a citizen, I didn't have to do anything special to kind of get that. Why is this idea important? Well, let me ask you, are you shocked that two million people are scheduled to walk across the southern border? Oh, absolutely. And without any ID, no background check, and the first thing they do is gonna break federal immigration law, and it won't be, the second thing they're gonna do is break federal immigration law by residing here illegally, and the third is probably they're gonna have ID that is not legal to continue to. And this is all at a time when all of us are supposed to be vaccinated. Right. Or we're looking at pictures of people landing, and I, I, we all support uh, legitimate refugees coming, to, but they are arriving in bases without any requirement as foreign nationals to be vaccinated by troops who have a deadline that they have to be vaccinated. And so, or where I live, we have school board elections now where people who are not uh, U.S. citizens can vote. Or we, all of the traditional privileges of citizenship, only citizens could leave the United States at will with a passport, that no longer applies. Citizens usually were the people who were eligible for state services. That no longer applies. Citizens alone could hold office. That is still there. It's the only one I can think of that, that distinguishes you and I from right. a, a resident, whether legal or not. They can vote in some cases, uh, serve in the military. So I was curious about all this and I tried to find out why that was historically and what was so good about citizenship because I would bump in where I live. Most of the people I bumped into out in rural Fresno County were not citizens. And I had no idea whether they were legal or illegal residents. It was chaotic. There were caste, as it were, and I didn't have a commonality with them because they just came across the border. Right. And then when you look at classical texts, the first thing you see is a middle class. They're not, is, they're not envious of the rich and they're not dependent on government as the poor are. And they're not always cajoling that the, as the rich are to get quid pro quo concessions. And Aristotle talks about the mesoid. And yet, if you look at middle class income, college uh, tuition debt, uh, credit card debt, uh, the middle class is beleaguered, especially mm -hmm. under globalization, the people in the interior of the country, they didn't have the skills that could be internationalized. Right. And what was weird about it is it has repercussions. The date people are getting married is gone from about 23 to 29. The first child is from about 24 to 20, uh, 31. Mm -hmm. The date when people buy their first home. So we're creating a prolonged, if I could use the term, pajama boy, or life of Julia, those commercials we saw during Obamacare, prolonged adolescence. And then I also noticed that in this organic process, it was almost like the migrations of the late empire. People were just coming and going, right. and there wasn't a sacred space, uh, a, a familiar landscape where people had a chance to reiterate their customs, their traditions, the familiarity with citizens. And yet that had been a, a hallmark of classical Greek and Roman citizenship, to the point people went to war if their mm -hmm. borders were impaired, say, in Greece. And yet we've lost that element. Then the big bane of citizenship was always a pre-civilizational, pre-modern tribalism. So you and I have nothing in common as U.S. citizens, only a superficial, say, we, were, we look alike. And we're going to identify first with our tri racial or ethnic tribe. In other words, race is essential, not incidental to who we are. Hmm. And that leads nowhere but to Rwanda or Iraq or the former Yugoslavia. And yet that's what we're doing right now. We're regressing back to 1840, 1850, mm -hmm. and, and we're all in this woke movement. But there's an elite concentrated effort to dismantle citizenship. And we, you can see it with the, the rejection of the word equality, which means equality of opportunity, replaced by equity and quality of result. Government is going to redistribute distribute income and advantage, often by race and gender. Mm -hmm. So what, what are they doing? How do they, they facilitate that uh, agenda? One thing is we have a permanent administrative state. We always have. It started really during the Depression with the New Deal and the Great Society, but now about 45% of Americans, 40%, work for the state, local, or federal government. And then we have evolutionaries. You probably have seen these, or you know them, academics, lawyers, activists, and they don't like the Constitution. That's a big issue here at Hillsdale. 
So what do they want to do? They want to evolve beyond it. So we're going to get rid of a 180-year mm -hmm. filibuster, not in the Constitution, but it's, it's a custom and tradition. The Electoral College is 233 less years junk it. The idea that a state like Michigan or California sets their own voting laws, for, even for national elections, unless the federal government wants to come in for women's right, you know, suffrage or 18-year-old vote, but we're going to try to junk that. 150-year-old nine-person Supreme Court, 60-year-old 50 states in the union. I could go on, but when the system doesn't work for the progressive mindset, then either change the demography or change the rules or change the whole constitutional mm -hmm. apparatus by which we make laws and elect officials. And then finally in the book I have a, a danger that I, I, I'm really worried about, and that's globalization. It's an ancient idea of cosmopolitanism, which is a Greek word for citizen of the world. But a lot of our elites, on the, our bi-coastal elites, feel that whether it's the Davos Great, Great Reset Project or the International Criminal Court or UN Commission on Human Rights uh, should, should trump U.S. sovereignty. They feel we're sort of an anomaly. Mm -hmm. We're a weird people that have right. Second Amendment or abortion laws, uh, banning abortions, types of abortion. We need to get with it. And you can see that when Anthony Blinken, our current Secretary of State, says that the UN should come in and investigate us. For, I could go on, but I, that, that's a very dangerous idea. Globalization was wonderful in giving Western consumer products, medicines, all over the world. But the idea that you would take the next step and harmonize uh, political norms and institutions outside the United States mm -hmm. that are far inferior is really dangerous. Right. And I think there is some sort of like a, perhaps a loathing, I guess, of American exceptionalism or something, and there's mm -hmm. a desire to change things. Where do you think that comes from? Well, Barack Obama, you remember, went to, Ber he had said on two occasions, I believe we're sex exceptional like the Greeks or the British. In other words, everybody believes there are. But he made no effort to quantify that in a dispassionate, empirical fashion. Mm -hmm. Do other countries have due process? Do they have habeas corpus? Do they have a free market? Do they have rights of inheritance? Do they have a rational system of adjudicating natural phenomena or scientific inquiry? Do they have gender equity? Do they have minority rights? No, most of the 198 nations in the world do not. But this hatred of America, I think it comes some, it comes from, to be quite frank, from envy and jealousy because this country only has 330 million people. It's not nearly as big as China, either area-wise or population, as 1.4 billion. Why is it so powerful? Why does it have the largest economy? Why does one U.S. worker at this late date in American history still produce 40% more goods and services than three of his Chinese counterparts? Wow. And when they look at popular culture, why are uh, American music, America, all over the world, I think, you know, just stop it, you guys. Mm -hmm. So they, they never make the next step and say, well, maybe we should have a Bill of Rights, or maybe we should have a free market economy, or maybe right. we shouldn't have government so large in our lives. Sort of like a regression to the mean, right? Instead of rising up, they're going to just bring us down is sort of the idea. I think Aristotle and Hesiod and Tocqueville, all of these philosophers, they all postulate that envy and jealousy are the most powerful of emotions. And they can be very destructive. I think Hesiod said there's a good envy, and that makes you see that guy over there and say, He's got a Mercedes. This is the American attitude. You go over there and you say to him, how did you get that Mercedes? And he said, well, you know, I sold real estate. Wow, I want to be that. Mm -hmm. The British or the, especially the continental European attitude or most places is, I want to go kick the door in on that guy. He must have done something mm -hmm. wrong and I, I'm a better person and I don't have one. Right. And that's what we're, that's why we're in a crisis now with the woke movement because that's one of its tenets that the system is unfair, it always was. 1776 is not our founding date. It was always racist, it was always uh, classist. And we need a complete year zero recalibration. Hmm. As I'm taking a class and we were discussing uh, the fall of Rome. And I think since Rome is sort of the, the model, I suppose, for citizenship that we adopted and everything, I found it also interesting that Rome, citizenship was not like birthright citizenship like it is here. There was a, a essay by a French scholar that postulated 240 causes to the fall of Rome whether it was inflation or too much military spending or too little or Christian, a given Christianity that destroyed the martial audacity of the legion, whatever it was. But one of the 
I think one of the more pertinent or compelling reasons was as it expanded from a republic to a Mediterranean empire, to a global empire, pretty soon tribalization, regionalization, and the system broke down. And that's what's very scary now because we're seeing it in a, ma a variety of manifestations. Uh, we're having a red and blue state. People are self-selecting mm -hmm. geographically, and we're not having this idea of the melting pot. It's mm -hmm. been rejected in favor of the salad bowl and now the right. woke bowl <laughs> that says you yeah. have to be racist to stop racism. It's an absurd idea. And the idea that we're going to check our DNA to find ethnic fides, mm -hmm. look how ridiculous it becomes. Ward Churchill is a Native American. Elizabeth Warren with high cheekbones. Rachel Dolezal is, is suddenly black. Sean mm -hmm. King is as white as I am. And it's almost as the reverse pattern of Jim Crow. When I was a young kid, you would hear stories of African Americans who were subject to enormous racism. And they were mixed heritage and they would pat they would say pass for white. Now we have people that are passing. And that should tell us something that the system then is not racially blind. Mm -hmm. And it's what Professor Kendi says, that it's okay to be racist to rectify prior racism. But the problem is we've got we're 150 years from slavery and we're fifty years sixty years into affirmative action. And we've forgotten Martin Luther King's content of our character rather than the color of our skin. So we've got a whole generation that grew up in an affluent, leisure America, a multiracial America. But we're somehow looking at the white middle class of the interior of the country, and we're creating all these terms for them, you know, Joe Biden's chumps, dregs, Obama's clingers. And I guess it's just a mechanism, as we said earlier, that you don't want to be around people of a different class. Class is something that's mobile and fluid. You and I are in the upper middle, middle class. Tomorrow we screw up, we could be, our children don't make it, they can be poor. And so that was a dilemma for Marx when he looked at states or nations that had a fluid upper middle, upward mobility. Marxism never worked here. But once you calibrate race into the equation, you say, I postulate that everybody who is non-white, we're, we're going to get rid of the old black-white binary we were working on, the legacy of Jim Crow or slavery. But now we're going to create a new word. This is mostly Barack Obama. It's called diversity. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You can be a Punjabi immigrant and farm 10,000 acres, but you are not white. You're diverse. You can be an Argentine aristocrat. And you can be blue-eyed and blonde hair, but if you have a Spanish-sounding name and trill your name and your name's Tony and you call yourself Antonio, then you are diverse. And that can lead to careerist advantages. And it's a new binary, but it's completely divorced from class. The idea of the civil rights movement where African Americans had discriminated, been discriminated so long and so perniciously that it affected their economic opportunity. That was what the EOC was. The, Economic Office of Economic Opportunity. It's not that anymore. LeBron is a victim. Barack Obama is a victim. Anybody's a victim mm -hmm. if they can claim that they have some uh, meritorious, uh, diverse background. 